Well, well, thank you for giving me this chance to talk about race, which you soon realise is a subject that dear to my heart, following my years of working with Rolls Royce through various universities on aircraft noise. But I'm well aware that rays aren't the whole story, and uh, I've been flabbergasted really in this program to see just what enormous accuracy you can get with the more traditional methods that don't have anything to do with rays. And it's, it's very distinctive of ray theory, it's an asymptotic theory. So when all works well, you can get more or less exact coalescence on a graph between the approximate and the um, exact solution as judged by the eye. And that's perhaps about three significant figures. But if you want machine precision or six or seven figures, you, you have to use the method which, uh, which you mainly adopt in this program. But I think nevertheless, the kind of analysis I'm going to present is very illuminating even when you're using you know, basic formula like what's <coughs> called the, the representations. So what I'm going to do then, I'm going to start out um, with uh, the actual ray approach that I actually use for real in the aircraft industry. And uh, mostly I'll be looking at 3D ray fields, but we'll also be analysing 2D fields as well. And in particular, a topic I, oh, thank you, a topic I looked at uh, in um, uh, airway view noise is the effect of the rotating sound field that's produced by the fan. And of course that fan is within a duct, and so the field from the fan is reflected repeatedly from the lining of the, uh, the duct walls. So the natural modal way to represent that is the absolute standard uh, mode involving vessel functions and um, exponential functions, and I'll give the ray analysis of that. So that will occupy the first quarter of the talk. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, a simpler problem than that, or it looks simpler at first, where you take away the duct. And that's normally called the open rotor problem. So this um, problem is essentially 3D. In the duct problem, you can imagine uh, that you're just looking at what's happening as you go along the duct, and that's basically a 2D problem. But as soon as you take away the duct and go to the open rotor, um, then it's a fully 3D problem. And I'm going to describe some computations I did originally, and the results definitely took me by surprise. And then what I'm going to do after that is show how you can simplify that. In this um, unducted rotor problem, I solved it numerically uh, initially by considering the whole of the fan, the whole of the rotor, in, you know, at all radii. But you can actually simplify that by just restricting the sources to a ring, a ring of sources. So that reduces the dimension. And I had a research student working on that film a few years ago. But then um, another development came back. Um, it's an even greater simplification. And this arose, I started thinking about this uh, from about last December when I made a visit to Liverpool to see Sasha and Natasha Movchan. We got talking about these rotating fields in relation to waves on plates. And it, it occurred to me that the kind of um, 3D pictures I've obtained also um, are what you get when you just look at a pure multipole, the standard separable solution of the wave equation in 3D. And I found um, remarkably, I did, some, I did a few computations on that in diagrams, that again, you get exactly the same picture. So that suggests another little ray calculation that I'll mention, though I haven't done it yet. And this relates to what's in this program in that um, with the ray pictures that I've got, it suggests a number of canonical problems because we'll see I have something very definite to say about the near field and its structure. So you can see very geometrically how near field scattering is rather different from um, far field scattering and how so long as you put the rays in the right place, there's a lot you can do. But the tricky point, which certainly wasn't always appreciated in early aerial acoustics work for rare uh, air ranges was where you have to put the rays. So that's going to be a big theme of this talk, where to put the rays. And the other theme is that if you put the rays in the right place, the accuracy is absolutely phenomenal. So long as when you approximate the uh, vessel functions or handle functions, you have to use the particular form, which is called the Debye form, which maybe not everyone's heard of. Um, and this has some very definite advantages in the near field compared with the more usual form. So we're going to hear a lot in this um, presentation about the pros and cons of these two different ways of doing the asymptotics. And 
for this talk, it's really the divine one that we need. But in, in many other problems where you're very remotely in the far field, you wouldn't want to use the divide. You want to use the more usual form. So that's an overview of the talk. And then at the end, in the last 10 minutes or so, I'll tell you the problems I've actually started doing, which relate to proper scattering using a Stuart's code. And I've already got the code to run on my machine. We've uploaded all the, uh, the class files that um, Stuart created, and I've got them to run. And, you know, with, with Stuart it's <coughs> there as well, we've actually got some very definite uh, range of things. So let me start then with a picture of an aero engine um, in its uh, schematic form. So it's the front of the aero engine on the left. And this is the same picture I put up in the talk I gave a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then we've got the, the rotor that you see when you step into an aircraft. You can see that rotor uh, from the left there when you go up the steps. And we're looking at a very different problem from the one I talked about before. Uh, previously, we considered what happens when gusts or turbulence get ingested by the engine, and then the gusts are chopped by the blades, and that is what we talked about. But of course, even if there are no gusts at all, you still get noise, you get what you might call the rotor alone noise, where simply by virtue of the fact that each fan blade has a loading, so you have a spinning of forces moving in circles. And it's a basic fact of acoustics that if you have a force that moves, that will generate a sound field. And in particular, for sources uh, moving in circles, you get a characteristic type of sound field that was actually first analyzed by Gutin, I think, uh, in the 30s. So this um, talk then is going to be about spinning fields which, uh, which don't involve uh, gusts at all. Now, as I said, we're going to start with the, the simplest possible mode that you can have in a cylindrical problem, which is just a spinning mode, where by separation of variables, you have a vessel function there, which I'll write as Jm of Kr times R. And we're going to have a spinning uh, field. So in the exponential term, we're going to have their omega t minus m phi minus kxx. So the spinning part is represented by the term omega t minus m phi. So you can see that if you kept the phase constant, if you take a fixed x, a constant phase would be, uh, say, a constant phi over t. So if you phi by dt would be omega over m. So that gives you a rotation rate of omega over m. Now, a decisive uh, point of view uh, from this talk is that when we have a Bessel function, this is the j, we're always going to think of that as being rather like a standing weight. And when you decompose it then into the sum of these two angle functions, the h1 and the h2, that's exactly like in elementary uh, courses on the contradicts with t. Well, you take something like a cosine and you write it as half the sum of e to the i something plus e to the minus i something. And when you're doing scattering problems, this decomposition is absolutely fundamental because from the scattering point of view, what's actually being scattered is the field moving at the speed of sound. So what's actually scattered are these two um, fields represented by the Hankel functions rather than the field as represented by the J itself. So when we uh, split the J into those two Hankel functions, then we get a decomposition which we, we call P plus and P minus. And for much of the time, I'll just be talking about one of these, which would be typically uh, P plus. Now, something we've heard many times already um, in this program is there's a profound change in a vessel or a Hankel function when the argument equals order. And that's extremely important when the order is high because then there is some definite high value of the argument. And when the argument equals to the order, and when the argument gets beyond that, you have a totally different type of field from when the argument is uh, less than that. Now, we've heard that repeatedly in this um, program, because it's absolutely fundamental to the convergence properties of the series when you have a graph series. But uh, in this talk, I'm going to emphasize more the geometrical side. And it's been very, very striking to me I don't think I've slept through any talk, actually, and I don't think we've seen, I've heard a single reference to the kind of geometrical picture that I'm going to talk about, even though it's what I think about. When I see the series that you put on, I immediately mentally convert every uh, Hankel function or Bessel function to um, as a function of its argument to when this transition uh, takes place. 
So uh, I've just really summarized here what we've just said. We've got a critical argument, which we call the critical radius, and that's M over KR in relation to the way I wrote it before. And for our purposes, um, in our cylindrical geometry, that gives us a particular cylinder of that radius. And we can call that the, either the caustic cylinder or the sonic cylinder. And this will be a caustic of the straight line rays which exist outside the cylinder. Because inside the cylinder, the rays are quite different. Um, they are, they're more like ordinary smooth um, helices. Now, I must say, I'm not 100, I think there may be another representation there, but for the purposes of this talk, we'll see that within this cylinder, um, you have this rotating field inside the duct. And then you have a, an, an imaginary cylinder uh, whose radius is less than the duct, the field is spinning fast enough. And then inside this cylinder, you have ordinary smooth helical rays. But in the annulus between this caustic cylinder and the, um, the duct itself, you have straight line rays, as we'll, um, as we'll see. So we're thinking of M as fixed. No? I'm thinking of M as fixed, but, it, but it's going to be arbitrary, but thick, right. so it can be large. Yeah, so that's, that's so quite right. Radius. And then what, pa pardon me? The critical range is obviously dependent on air. Uh, absolutely. And in fact, and although I've written it there as a kind of static term, what it's really about is the sonic radius, because this, this field is spinning. And if you imagine, again, this is, uh, I'll, I'll mention this now as it's come up. Suppose you just have a rotor. It might be spinning at quite a low Mach number, say Mach number a tenth. So the tips aren't moving very fast. You can imagine defining an, an imaginary line, just the radius going out. And when you get to a certain distance, hypothetically, you can imagine that it would be rotating at a sonic radius. And that gives you a cylinder which can be outside the rotor if the rotor is subsonic. And later on, that's going to be very important. And I just, again, I'm going to emphasize a lot to do with physical ideas here, because for the rotor I've just described, there's absolutely nothing that appears to be happening in this radius. It's just the fresh air, basically, and there's a, a rotor spinning miles away inside. But nevertheless, we'll see there is a fundamental change, nevertheless, in the field when you cross this radius. Even though at first sight, there's absolutely nothing there and nothing special could occur. And this is kind of implicit in all these infinite series we have, believe it or not, involving your, your graphs. Isn't it? So, yeah, please, yeah. So even if you see why it is better, which is just printing one, or maybe you will see data. So it's going to come back repeat in diagram. Yeah, yeah. But for now, I know nothing about it. You know nothing about it, yeah. So it's not clear why it is. Yes, but it will become clear in relation to dark. You're quite right, yeah. Yeah, I would say if you've never seen this before, it might look a bit peculiar. And the point I'm going to emphasize is that all the rays I'm going to describe, in a certain sense, they're invisible. In that if you go back to that uh, basic formula involving the Jn times the e to the i, if you take the real part of that, you get cosine of something times the Bessel function. And if you plot that, what you get is this pattern. Well, that's where I'm, let's move on to it now. If we take, with that Bessel function expression, if we take a section at a fixed axial position, all you've got is the product, when you take the real part, you've got the product of a Bessel function and say a cos A theta. So when you do the plots, you see this. Um, and so for every zero of the Bessel function, you have a zero contour. So you see this potentially going on in all as far as you like, and that's rotating. So this looks like a dartboard with the, the metal thread you see on the dartboard, and it's rotating. So that is the field. So if you simply do a contour plot, and we've seen many contour plots of fields in this talk, in this program, and you, you see something moving. And what you actually see moving is this picture that looks like a dartboard. So if you imagine following any point, what do you see? You take a point here and you follow it, and you see circles. So it looks like all you've got is circles anywhere. But of course, this is the translating. If you imagine it in the duct with the e to the i, k, x, um, these things are really cylinders. So the actual field to look at, it's just you have cylinders coming out and it's rotating and coming, so coming forwards. So any point like this is on a helix. So what it looks like is that this, when plotted, is giving you a family of smooth pieces. 
Now, where on earth are the straight line rings? You can't see them, but we're going to see in a minute. They are there. So this is what actually happens then. So I'm kind of jumping a bit to how one would actually represent the field um, uh, in an aircraft engine. So here we imagine that somewhere further back here, say, there's a fan blade. So it's rotating. So there's a source here, which is rotating here. And that's producing a spinning field. And as I said, what you might expect is all the rays would look like this at every radio station. But that is not actually the case. What the rays actually are, they are piecewise linear helices. The rays consist of straight lines, um, which um, successively reflect off the walls of the duct. So they, they bounce, they go around like this, and you have an infinite family of these. I've only drawn one. We have to imagine that diagram being given every possible translation. So you have a field of infinitely many uh, piecewise linear helices. So if you take, this is the, uh, the front of the aircraft engine. So this is the ring of the front face of the duct. So it's being continually radiated by rays. And the point is these rays are straight lines. So if you take any point on the rim of the duct, it's being continuously hit by rays, by a ray at a particular angle, which is determined by the mode. And I should say, these, the angles here are determined entirely by the parameters in that vessel function and the exponential multiplying rule. Now, it's a basic um, aspect of the geometrical theory of diffraction. Oops, sorry, let's go. So it's a basic aspect of the geometrical theory of diffraction that when a ray strikes an edge, the actual uh, scattered field um, has a ray structure involving a cone. And the way to construct this cone is to take the tangent to this rim, which I've drawn here going up. But I've taken this point, happened to be at the remote point on the rim. So this tangent here to the rim is going up. And then you've got a very definite ray direction. I've drawn it as a dashed line here, which is the continuation of this ray. And you just rotate that, um, this line, the dash line, around this uh, tangent. And that gives you a cone. And that is where the uh, scattered field is. And it's the fact that when you evaluate, you merit through any method at all that's accurate, when you evaluate what's happening in the far field uh, here, that's being produced by this mode coming to the end of the duct here, and then being scattered, it has exactly this, uh, this structure. And again, if you've never seen it before, it might seem a bit surprising, but if you already know the geometrical theory of diffraction, which is, which is especially associated with Joe Keller, and it's been a fully established theory since the mid forties, absolutely established. So if you know that theory, this immediately makes a lot of sense. Um, so long as you are aware that the, the race structure consists of these piecewise linear helices coming around here. Now, as I said, um, the rays inside this uh, sonic cylinder or caustic radius, they are um, smooth helices um, like this. So what I've drawn here is a kind of end view. This is what you see from the end view. And so this, this view here then, where you have these arrows coming around here, they, they correspond just to the projection on the transverse plane of these um, pieces. And then you, this is just the front view of the, uh, of the cones. Now I've drawn that out here. Let me just see if I can turn this off. I've drawn that here. So for a particular rotation rate, you see here, there'll be a particular radius uh, that corresponds to the sonic radius as we described. And then outside this um, uh, sonic radius, the rays are at uh, straight lines. And then inside, they, uh, they are on, um, on the surface. Now, you might say, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah no, far away. So I understand at the end, along to one of the poles, one of the multiple points. It's one, yeah, one of the parameters, yeah, yeah. cos m theta, yeah. 
So it does one ray belong to one value of M, or is one ray belong to the whole? Yeah, no, I would say each M gives you an infinite family of rays. So if I give you a given M, let's go back. Um, yeah, well, you know, I originally wrote out JM of KRR. That gives you a function of, of that gives pressure as a function of position. So that gives you a, a pressure in everywhere in space. And the point I'm saying is that function has the structure of a superposition of infinitely many rays. And then if you imagine, if you were look, if you're doing the 2D problem, then the the race, you have infinitely many, I've only drawn few, but you have an infinitely many number of these. So you have a, a field of rays filling the whole of space. So what do you do? You imagine every possible tangent in this caustic circle, and that gives you, it does actually give you two lines through every point in space out there. You've got one going this way and one going that way. And that's why it is that in that diagram I showed with the piecewise linear helices, you're going out to the duct and then in again. So this particular pattern you see, if you imagine kind of coming out here, if we imagine the duct wall, I can probably draw that in actually. Suppose the duct wall was here. You can imagine following a ray to the duct wall, then it reflects. But when it reflects, it just comes out to be one of the other sanders. And so you just arrest it separately. Uh, reflecting off the wall, but always being tangent to this caustic um, cylinder. Well, you might say, how do I know that? Well, it all comes down to Debye's approximation, which I've just drawn out here. Now, now, first of all, I ought to mention the, the traditional approximation. Um, so the traditional approximation for the Hankel function in the far field is this expression, and you just have a, a root two over pi kr, multiplied by this. And if you imagine what the ray structure is here, all you do is you take a fixed value of this and uh, track it. And then what you find is if you take a fixed time and a fixed phi, then when you track this, you get a family of rays which look like this. You get rays which are all moving away from the origin. So this is a genuine far field approach, because in the far field, what you often want to imagine is that you're so far away from the source, it just looks like a point. And therefore it's entirely reasonable that all the rays are coming from that point, which you think of as being the origin. But you see here, the point is we're gonna describe this family of rays as being straight lines here, only in the outside the cylinder. So what that means then is, and if you take a point here, there's a ray coming in this direction, and a ray coming in that direction. And you see, they are not pointing anywhere near the or away from the origin. They're tilted. So the point is that the rays, as represented by any value of n that's different from zero, the rays do not actually point uh, to or from the origin. That they are pointing in such a direction to be tangent to this circle or cylinder. And that's absolutely fundamental. And that was basic to the diagram I had shown the cones, because it was the angles of these rays which gave you the, the cones. And of course, if you're a long way away, then you can regard this radius as being a negligible size. So it's entirely reasonable if you're in the very far field to use this standard approximation. But the point to bear in mind is, if you imagine a family of problems where this end gets bigger and bigger, this is non uniform because if I take any point, it doesn't matter how far away you are, if we take a, this fixed KR, R is now fixed, and you imagine your series where you're doing a summation over N, you're going up to arbitrary large N. So as the Ns get bigger, this caustic cylinder gets bigger, and if the rate of the caustic cylinder parameterized by N, eventually cross you and um, go out. So what that means is that as n increases, this approximation is, uh, gets less and less useful if you want to describe the ray field. And you have to go over to the divide to get the right direction. So what that means then is, even if you're miles away, if n is large, the rays are becoming like this. And then once n becomes so large, this caustic cylinder 
is at a larger radius than your position, then you're in this inner zone here, which is quite different, which is more like evanescent waves. Now, of course, this is all implicit in the way you analyze your infinite series, because, you know, in a sense, you know all this already. But this is just a different way of thinking of it. So my way of thinking of this is to say that when n gets larger, um, um, you have to start thinking more, if you were going to think in ray terms, of the direction in which the rays are coming. Uh, if the differential equation yeah. for the year, and then uh, both usual and even the becomes a version of double. It, it is. Uh, well, now, this is a very important point. Now, again, but the, is the yeah, that's correct. Now, I would actually but say, I've got a comment to make about that. Yeah. 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 And then it, this, yeah. all this transition and first attack phenomena is not about going double, you can be breaking uh, up near the oh, Absolutely. And, uh, now, yeah. this is an absolutely vital point. Yeah. This is exactly how I think about it. What is the ultimate reason why the bias approximation is so accurate? I'm going to show you in a minute just how accurate it is. So what is the ultimate reason why the bias is so accurate? And the real reason is that WKB is very, very accurate. You know it used to be called the phase interval method, and the essence of WKB is that you have something like e to the i interval KDX, and you're integrating a local wave number. Well, that is very, very accurate until you get very close to the turning point. So the ultimate reason why the bias is accurate is exactly as you suggested that you're using WKB. But what you find is that in this approximation, you are not using WKB, but you're keeping K as constant. Um, so in a sense, this is the opposite of WKB. When you're doing, you're not really doing a phase integral, you're kind of fixing the, you know, the rate of change of phase. So the reason this is so good and this is less good is that this is not a proper WKB method. Let's just carry on with the slides. Pardon me? Uh, oh, these are just, this is just parameterization. I should say, uh, in the divide, you have to distinguish between argument greater than order and argument less than order. So this is just a parameter. So what you would do then, so here all I'm saying is that I'm defining KR, in the first case, I define KR to N set B, so B to the set to the minus one. So you can always eliminate B, but likewise here, it's going to be something similar, but with the check. So it's just a parameter to make the formula easier. Now, very often you do see it without that parameter, and then you get things like quarter powers and square roots. It's just slightly, slightly easier to write that that's right. there's, there's, a, there's a yeah there's a, there's a few metric things you're quite right so there's a lot in this once you get familiar with it but all aspects of it means it's very sharp this is exactly the point i'm going to come to it's amazingly sharp now this is a very very important point when you think of far field approximations, what you often think of is the fact that it gradually gets better as you get further away. And that is true with this first approximation. It gradually gets better. But with the divide, it immediately gets better once you're beyond a quite small distance from the course field. And again, this was absolutely vital to my thinking. Uh, I, uh, I think that's, uh, yes, I'm, I can't remember the exact, yes, about 1900, so we kind of summer fell. In Peter Dubai, he might have been a student of summer fell. Is, is that that kind of state? Uh, anyway. I it was before the Oh, we lost. What's happened here? Have I lost something? My battery hasn't been flat, has it? I don't think so. Something come out. Uh -oh, some of you. You, 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 you
Oh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't need to be plugged in to anything. I've not knocked anything out. Thanks very much. So I'll uh, well, I'll draw another diagram then. Go on to your Absolutely, that's exactly what you do. How you get the area, yeah. absolutely, that's really. Yeah, that's the easiest way to do it. I think that's how dividing it. So let's draw a question. I'll do it to you. Now, the caustic radius is about here. You see, let's call it the payoff. I'll give it to function of R. So this is the caustic radius that I described. Now, when you do the vessel function for argument greater than order, it's indistinguishable. It gets to here and then it goes up like this. So it only fails here. That's the region where it fails. And coming up here, the fails here. So it's extremely accurate. When you do a plot, um, this is the only region where it fails, and what you'll see is probably that's a forty way side of the range. Now you might say this is all very well for large A, but what happens to small A? And I remember vividly checking this out uh, thirty years ago, and I was simply astounded. You do it and say J four, and it's absolutely no different. Although this is in a slightly different, let's do it for J one. So the by approximation is extremely accurate for any n. Now, what about k zero? You might think it must fail to k zero, but even that is not the case because the k zero. Uh, you have this because the j zero is distinct in the. Uh, Argument zero, the value is one. And so, of course, the caustic radius is zero. So, it's only worth doing the out of it. And blow me, you could, there's an absolutely trivial limiting operation. And then to be uh, defined, that needs the same. So, in fact, with that limiting operation, the defy reduces to the one. Oh, sorry. Sorry, oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, with the um, even, even um, J zero with this trivial limiting operation. Get this. Well, 
experiments and we to it and then talked about what this and the accuracy. I can probably carry on with the talk actually at this stage. Now, I realized then that it's entirely by writing a trivial code, I realized this was very, very accurate. And then I had a brain. I realized I asked myself the question, how is it that this is so accurate, especially as these look a mess? And if you do it non-parametrically, it's all um, square root terms. And then I had an idea. Perhaps all this is, is giving you the equation of a straight line in cylindrical coordinates. Because you can imagine, if you were going to do straight line in cylindrical coordinates, in polar coordinates, it's a bit of a mess. And if you were going to describe it going back to our school days anyway, you would do it parametrically. And in fact, I then checked it out. So what I did, I took the original solution that I wrote on. So the way I actually obtained this result for the aero engine was the following. I had an idea that the Debye formula, although it looked a messy, they might really just be describing straight lines in uh, polar coordinates. So what I did... I simply wrote out these expressions. It has to be the Hankel. You have to include so both the J and the Y. And what's absolutely essential is you must include all those other terms, the E to the I N minus I N phi and, all, and the I K X. And when you do that, and, and then you put this in, and with, with the, the Hankel, you see you get exponentials here, E to the I something. And lo and behold, it did give exactly straight lines. When I converted it, it gave exactly straight lines. So the, the essential reason to my way of thinking as to why the Debye approximation works is that all it's doing is it's giving you a kind of coordinate representation of straight lines which are tangential to here. And this is in the paper I wrote on this, which is in, the, in JFN. So if you think of it as being a two-stage process, we know that if we approximate the exact J solution by Debye, it's going to be very, very accurate for any value of N, except when you're in a small region here. So in this diagram here, you get a very small region here. You have to just shade out a little annulus around this circle. And we know precisely the width of this annulus, because it corresponds precisely to this width, which is basically half a wave on either side of the uh, caustic rings. Now I'm shading it a bit there because the experts will know for a, 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 a vessel function of order n, there's a kind of length scale here that involves n to the third, and that comes in your criterion uh, for various uh, truncation orders. So I'm kind of shading it a bit, but if we'll allow that to be a smoothed over somewhat, you basically um, must exclude a quarter wave either side of the caustic, and so long as you exclude this very narrow region, the description by straight line rays is very, very accurate. It's as accurate as the dashed lines here are close to the approximate curve. So this gives you an absolutely definite result, which to my way of thinking is very critical. But what it tells you is these rays are absolutely real. They're very, very accurate as a description of the exact vessel function solution. So in relation to your question, it's, it's a very, very sharp cutter between the ray theory and the region here. Now, in the um, to match up here, strictly speaking, you need an airy function. But you see, even that's a slight exaggeration because you only need a tiny little bit of the airy function. Right. Um, this one down. Sure, we the door. Observation that if you take any function, yeah, as simple of its zeros are just a be remarkably robust ones for the just zero. Uh, absolutely, so already that is, uh, easily, yeah. easily, because you see, 
the, 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 the failure region is only here. So even the first zero, it's yeah. well within the range. Yeah. So that means you're quite right. The first zero of the area function is described to any reasonable degree of accuracy by a pure rate that's already in the straight line range, which is remarkable. But how do we know that really? It's numerical. And I should say this has been a characteristic feature of my research over many years. I always, if it's an idealized problem, do the numerics. I don't want just to do the approximation to stop. I want to do the numerics. I want to know very, very accurately uh, why it is, uh, where it is that the approximation fails or where it succeeds. And what you very often find with a good approximate method, it's very, very sharp, the, the um, transition between the But that's why. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so sir. This uh, is it possible to get higher order terms and make that all the way away? Uh, uh, it is, but it will get worse. Again, uh, this is a very, very interesting point. Let me just. Well, I have to stand here. Oh, we're in business. Fantastic. Now, what you'll find is that if you go to higher order terms in the Dubai, this is a complete series, and it's all in Bavamovitz and Stegen or the NIST handbook or online, you get the complete series. But what you find is that series gives you much greater accuracy when you're at the large R, for example. Once you get close to the core state, it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's a bit like um, having a, a series, if you have a, say, um, a far field that goes like one over R, obviously in the near field, it's nothing like one over R. But if you go, say, to the next term, one over R squared, that's even worse in the near field. The singularity is even worse. And again, I, I've... I've got some kind of silly ideas about this, actually, which perhaps I can, as you mentioned, it, it's to do with um, analytic continuation. Everybody knows that analytic continuation is a highly unstable process numerically. And in a sense, although that sounds a bad thing, it's a thoroughly good thing in relation to certain asymptotic formulae and equivalent effective. I'll go into that, but there's a lot in that remark that you've uh, made there. Well, let's press on. Oh. Computer, well, this has to be there. Yeah. Oh, what's happening here? Oh, that's probably talking to the wrong computer now. So just use your hands. Oh. Oh, yeah, oh, that doesn't work. Uh, there we are. Um, oh, my oh, computer hasn't gone, has it? No. Oh, um, what did you do there? Oh, tap. Oh, tap. tap. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So all I've done here is I've um, we had all those rays on helices, and I said we have an infinite family of those helices, and if you group them up differently. You get you get planes um, doing that, and also you can take two neighbouring planes at different angles and get a ratio. So there's a lot more you can do with those piecewise linear helices. Mm -hmm. And I've made um, a few remarks there about the, the cones themselves. If you take the cones that we had, uh, you can see that some point backwards. So it's very very interesting fact that although the helices represent waves coming out of the duct. When they're diffracted and form these cones by the rim, you get a quarter of the rays are, at, uh, are actually pointing back in the duct and a quarter of the rays are pointing outside the duct as well. So this, these cones do explain the, um, the radiated field in, uh, in some detail. Now here I've simply drawn very accurately what I just sketched. So if we take J24, I've drawn the exact and approximate both for the J and the Y. And then the one on the uh, top right there, that's J1 and I've done uh, J0. And you see, if anything, the Y is even more accurate than the J. So these are very accurate uh, plots there. And there I've just written out the Debye, which we've had on the, uh, on the blackboard anyway. And there I've drawn the rays that are inside the caustic um, cylinder, which do appear to go on easy. But I must say, I've got some doubt about that. There might be some theory where they, they are actually the, the combination of two inhomogeneous waves propagating slightly different directions. So that's something I might come back to in due course. And then all I've done here is I've simply said what I said earlier about this helix going forward. Uh, the, well, the, the kind of dartboards going forward. And it apparently gives you smooth helices. But in reality, with the Dubai explanation they're straight lines rather than uh, smooth helices outside 
And here I've just drawn a, put a slide on giving you the basic Keller theory, which I described. So up here you see, this is just a, a, a spray change. You've got an incident ray coming in and then you just extend it beyond where it hits the edge and then rotate it around and you get the diffractive rays. And it also works in planar problems. In a planar problem where the ray is coming in like this, the cone gets flattened to a disc. So you get diffracted rays in, in those directions as well. And there's more you can do with this. Um, one of um, Nigel Peake's research students called um, Graham Key, he, uh, he put in, he, he put in um, a scarf angle, as it's called there. Um, the idea being that the, uh, if you have an angle for the end of the air, you can make the rays go upwards and keep the sound off the ground. But it's not entirely successful. You find some of the rays can actually go down more than they did before. But Graham Keith worked out a pretty complete geometrical theory of the scarf duct. So that's all I'm going to say then about the, the rays in, in cylindrical ducts. And what I'm going to do now in the rest of the talk is consider um, what, what happens when there's no duct at all. And this is very important as a potential design of an aircraft engine. That's the so-called unducted fan. And the point is, without the, the, the duct around the outside, it's much more fuel efficient. So whenever oil prices go up, there's a huge interest in these fans. And also to save fuel, it's very useful to have another blade row behind the main blade row at the front going in the opposite direction. And that reduces the swirl. And that's another method of a saving uh, fuel. But of course, these things do make quite a lot of noise, as you might imagine. And I've written up there plenty of multiple, multiple scattering here, which there is, you see. The noise from each blade is, is horribly scattered. Uh, in its near field by the other blades moving very fast in the in the opposite direction. So there's a whole lot of theory uh, that has been worked out by Tony Parry in particular. Yeah, so is that the main reason we don't see them? It's because there's no noise. That, that is correct. Um, and there's other aspects as well, but that currently is a major, a major. They also might not be um, acceptable. There's something about them that looks old fashioned and unattractive compared with the smooth elegance. You mean they look uh, like propellers? Like they look like propellers. It, it look a bit like 1950s aircraft. So there might be huge consumer resistance, kind of status and snobbery element there. Yeah. I bet that's a big factor actually at the chief exec level. Anyway. So what I did for that problem, I did a, I did a numerical analysis where I took um, a highly idealized um, rotor where I just took, you know, obviously, for any decomposition of sources in the rotor plane, you can split it into harmonics. So you take a particular um, loading, for example, having a, a, a dependent sine of n theta minus omega t. So that's rotating at rate capital omega, and there are n loads. So that's a simple model of a propeller with either with two n, n blades. So you think of that, and that can represent either um, a loading due to the thickness or it can be thickness noise or, or bucking noise, but that won't really affect uh, what follows. Now, when I did the, uh, this is accurate numerical plot, we get a diagram there, which is exactly like what I've been describing, only that because there isn't a duct, you only have an H1, you knock out the H2. So we're no longer doing um, the Js, we're in H1 territory. And in this case, when you simply plot the field, that is what you get. And you can see there what's very, very interesting is that up to the sonic radius, the, the pattern of contours, they go on radial lines. Uh, so this whole pattern is, is rotating. Now, I should say here, the lines I've drawn, they are the lines of constant phase, not the rays. The rays themselves are at right angles. So if you imagine a tangent, a straight line coming from this point S, as it goes up, you see, it, it, at the right angle, sorry, from the right place, it does actually cross every, every contour at right angle. So when this uh, pattern spins, it does actually correspond to a straight line rays. So the rays are really lined at right angles to these uh, contours. So what you find is that um, this does actually represent those straight line rays, although you can't see them directly on that diagram, which are tangential to this uh, circle well, going through this point S, the sonic radius. So, and then, but what's very, very interesting is that inside here, the pattern is quite different. This corresponds to the exponential terms that we saw um, in Dubai. Again, it's not quite that because I've got a ring of, of 
points out that this is a, a spinning distribution. So this then does raise very interesting questions of scattering. Because if you put a scatterer in this far field, you might expect a very different behavior from a scatterer inside this region here, where the lines are, phase lines there are straight. And, but what was even more interesting uh, here is that when you do it in 3D, you find that this region of straight line, uh, of straight line, it lies outside a kind of ellipsoidal surface. So what I was expecting was that with this spinning disc, there'd be some kind of cylinder extending parallel to the axis of rotation. And it would be outside this cylinder that you have the rays, but that wasn't the case. I was very surprised to find that you, what it's actually like is a spinning orange. So you, if you imagine a kind of orange and think of its segments, then those segments represent alternating regions of positive and negative pressure from this rotor, and that's the near field. Then if you think of the peel of the orange, that's this caustic region where you have the transition. And when you're outside the, the orange, I'm, I haven't actually checked it directly, but I'm certain that also is a field of straight line rays. But this is now a three dimensional problem. So you have to do a bit more work to find the exact angles. So what I've drawn here then, this um, diagram on the left here, that's the meridional section. This is the axis of rotation. So the disc plane is a, is a kind of disc here and it's rotating about that vertical axis. And then if you take this um, arc here, if you imagine it extended all the way around here and then rotated around this axis, you can see that's going to give you an ellipsoidal shape. And then inside that ellipsoidal region, you have the near field corresponding to the, the by approximation with argument uh, less than order. And then outside you have this radiating field. So again, you have this very, very clear boundary between the radiating field, which is represented by straight line rays, and the region inside that, which is represented by a more of an evanescent type wave. I also did plots at a fixed rate, fixed um, cylindrical R. So if you imagine a kind of cylindrical, drawing an imaginary cylinder around the vertical axis of rotation, what would the contours pressure look like there? Well, when you're well, well within the sonic cylinder, it looks like this. So what that means is when I said it's like segments of an orange, the segments are really are like that. They're not really hard. And then once you get beyond that, um, you get this kind of curved structure. So with these pictures, you can easily build up a 3D picture. Although nowadays with 3D computer graphics, I would almost certainly have just drawn a three-dimensional picture of this spinning orange. So that's the, the ray structure then of a, a, an ordinary rotor. And I've drawn it there for the subsonic uh, tip. So I've just simply um, written out there what I've uh, described with the kind of field. Now, again, what I've done there, let me just go back here. Um, so there I just worked out how the overall shape varied with the, uh, the map number. So let's not go into that too much. Now, although I've drawn it there for spinning fields, this also is relevant to non-spinning fields, because if you just take two of those in opposite directions, rotating in opposite directions and superpose them, then you get a non-spinning uh, non field, exactly like the standing wave representation where a Bessel function is regarded as the sum of the two Hankel functions. So although what I've drawn there is for a rotating field, it's exactly relevant just by adding two of them, not rotating in opposite directions, and that will give you a, a non-rotating uh, field. So I think this is very relevant to the kind of scattering problems that we've heard about in this program, um, even, even though they aren't concerned with uh, rotating fields. Now, what I um, then thought I'd do was simplify it further. That was for a distributed um, rotor over with a with sources over a whole range of radii, but then I just repeated it where I only put sources on a ring. And I was very interested to see if that would make any difference. And in fact, it made absolutely no difference or almost no detectable difference. So I just draw that you got, when I did it for a ring of sources, I got exactly the same pictures. And it's just a, a mini little MATLAB code there. And then you get, that's the picture we've seen already 
but that is now for a ring of point sources. Um, and this is still for the ring. So all the point of those pictures is that those pictures are for a ring and they give exactly the same solution for distributed sources over a disk. But then it occurred to me uh, a few months ago that you can make it simpler still. Why not just plot, do a similar 3D plot for the, the general um, separable solution of the wave equation in 3D? So this is just the, the arbitrary multipole in 3D um, where we have, uh, we have a spherical Hankel function. So here, in where I've written a small hn, that's an ordinary Hankel function of order n plus a half. And you have to divide by a square root because we're going to go over to spherical spreading. So you must have an extra square root there uh, added onto this to give one over z in the uh, amplitude factor. And then the general solution involves the two extra parameters. You've got an azimuthal order m corresponding to the variation with azimuthal angle. And then we've got um, a dependence on the polar angle theta. And I've used the physicist convention here for polar coordinates. So phi is the azimuthal angle around the axis and theta is the polar angle from the axis. So all I did, I just did a simple plot to plot the, um, the contours of that. So let's look at that. And in fact, that also came out to be exactly the same. So what it means is that all those pictures that I've just shown you, they really are almost identical to the field of a, uh, an arbitrary multipole. So that means an arbitrary multipole has this kind of spinning orange structure. And I believe one could get directly um, from that formula, the exact equations of the rays, because remember we've got this associated Legendre function there, PNM of cos theta. Well, there are many, many asymptotic formulae for the PNM of cos theta. And some years ago, I did look at them and I could see that some were of Debye type. You could absolutely tell by the structure of them that some were of Debye type and some were of this simpler type. So it's pretty clear to me that if you took those um, asymptotic approximations for the PNM and combine them also with the Debye for the HN, in no time at all, you'd get explicit formula for the ray structure um, of that multi -point, multipole. And in effect, what you'd get is you'd get a family of tangents coming off this spinning, uh, spinning orange. So I think we've nearly finished now. So again, all I did here was... Um, do some plot. Now, again, what's very remarkable is that um, I said that these the by approximation, although nominally it's for large order, it in fact applies for any order. So it also applies for a rotating dipole. So you can have an ordinary dipole just by superposing two of these. So even for the ordinary dipole, the picture of the rays. Oops. Oops. Oh, okay. We'll leave that for a minute. The picture of the rays is rather like this with a little cylinder, but it's not very, not very big. I see Stuart sitting there looking bemused. The pic, yeah, the, we missed out. These are these. I've got some very fine pictures which show a scattering of these fields by point sources um, using Stuart's code. And I'll, well, I, let me describe the results. I can. Okay, when all else fails, use chalk. So I can actually remember the results. I have seen that picture. Yeah. In fact, it, it might be even better if I draw them on this board compared with the slides. It would only take me two minutes. Right. So shall we? So shall we? So if we have the plan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Right. So for Stewart's code, that's 2D, or it is at the moment anyway. So what we had was if we have, say, a rotor here using a field, then we have a sonic radius. And when you draw the, the contours of pressure, you get these spirals coming around like this. When you draw the contours of pressure, they kind of play Pardon me? Are these lines of constant? Yeah, these are, yeah, not the rays. The rays are at right angles to this. But in here, you see the contours go more like that. 
So the question is, what happens if you put a scatter in there? What's of great interest to Stuart and myself is the following. If you put if you put the scatterer, you can either put it here, say, in the near field, you can put it at the sonic radius, and you can fill it up here. Now, when you do that, what you find is we've just done this numerically, and my aim in doing it myself is to work out the ray theory. Because if I know the answer, I reckon I can produce the theory. So what you find is that when you put these sources in, you get a kind of pattern, you get extra bits out here, so you get a kind of lump. But remember, on each of these arcs going out, the field is, um, is decreasing in amplitude, just like the, M, the one over square root law. But of course, this is giving a scattered field with a certain directivity related to the fact that the field here is coming in, in a certain direction. So what the, the plots show very, very clearly is you get the kind of lumps there. So you can see then that there's an extra field superposed on top, and that can be, and you can see from the pattern of these, they do go in straight lines, which is perhaps the obvious in the far field. So we've got a very, very definite interference pattern, and they are very, very different for this one, this one, and this one. And you can see at once the rays are in different directions. So a natural task is to see if we can come up with the ray theory which gives a simple formula, basically using, for the 2D case, it is the by, and for the 3D case, if you have it, say, I'll draw the rotor, rotor for taking a horizontal scale. Now, for this one, this is a sonic radius, or it's, well, it's, it's only sonic in this plane, so it's, a, it's really a, your orange peel. What sonic radius are we going to from this thing? So here you have your kind of segments of the orange rotating, and this is the peel. And then you can try putting a scatterer here or here in all sorts of places. And also you can put multiple scatterers in. And for me, this is very interesting because I know in your real problems, you have many, many scatterers. But you see, in your graph formula with large N, what's interesting to me is each scatterer here, it's in the field of all the others. And depending on the value of N, they're either in this bit or in that bit. Now, of course, when you add it up, you're adding up vast numbers of rays, and it might be very difficult to keep track of all those rays. So in that sense, the ray decomposition might not be ideal. But there's something here we can look at. And at that point, I'll stop. Now, I do think you're the perfect audience for this with the numerical and the analytical side. You like rays. I, mean, I, I never think about rays. Because they are very, very accurate and they tell you what's happening. So, for example, if you take that picture I showed of the Keller cone, they tell you in a very straightforward way where the sound goes and why it goes there. So, why don't you like them? <laughs> and it's what you see. So, well, it's what you see. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, if it's a nice sunny day, you know the sun's coming here. Don't you see? Well, it's, oh, it's from there. You're not you, thinking you I can rain, put this in an infinite sum, and when I add up a thousand terms, it will tell me, oh, the sun's over there. Whereas you can just look. Yeah. <laughs> and it's coming from the direction of the rays. Yeah. But that is one reason. I know the geophysicists, they love rays. You know, when they talk about seismic. Yeah. They do indeed. They, they, yeah. they love yeah. and, and optics people. But it's all to do with high frequency. Now, I want to say in aeroacoustics, when you when you come to low Mach, I'm really talking about fairly high Mach number. Once you get to low Mach number, it's a completely different world. And I think I mentioned this in the answer to a question. Yeah. So it's very, very interesting. But even then, with the low Mach number limit, once you're far enough away, you have rays. But it's rather different from this in the near field. So in these kinds of problems yeah. here that you're talking about, with the work with Stuart, what's the, um, what's the wavelength there? Um, well, in effect, um, uh, well, yeah, uh, there's a kind of scaling law. I would say, because we're looking at rotating fields, there's a kind of self-similarity, and there aren't many parameters. So if I give you a rotor, what really matters is the Mach number, because the Mach number tells you how far the sonic radius is as a multiple of the rotor radius. So that's a basic, so the Mach number is a fundamental parameter, and then and then the frequency that tells you how many of these you have. So a very basic uh, aspect, which I'm certainly intend to investigate, 
is in Stuart's code, we have a definite radius here. And at the moment, it's a moderately large radius or medium. Very interested to see if we can do that for a much larger radius or a much smaller radius. And I'd be very interested to know, I'm going to ask Stuart later, whether the code would work for a, a point scatter or very, does it work for very low radius scatters? Yeah. So it will definitely give you the idealist, idealized case of a point scatter. Yes, well, That's more like radius scatter. Comparing the wavelength with the size of the scatter, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's another that's a parameter. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you, you, again, I've made a list of all the parameters for the road to only three parameters, actually. Um, given, if you allow for scale, imagine that any change of scale isn't really of interest to scale it out. But then you do R left, exactly as you say, you're left with a separate independent parameter, which is the radius of the scatterer, which you would write as a multiple, either of the sonic radius or of the rotor radius. So that's another parameter. And that's and of course that will tell you then presumably whether you have a Rayleigh really type scattering or, or something else for the high frequency. Yeah. So that's another parameter. So yeah. can I just unpick, go back a little bit? Yeah. So you're talking about um, the Mach number and the rate of speed. Yeah. So do those two tell you what N is a uh, most interest? Is that what that, that, that's right? Because in the background we've got the speed of sound. So for the overall for the, the pattern then, if you, if you take the, 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 the outer radius of the rotor, that has a certain maximum, which is speed divided by the speed of sound. And then that determines then the ratio of where the uh, caustic cylinder is in relation to the rotor. And then um, for the, so, so and then you've got the number of lows. Yeah, pardon. Add a certain rate of speed yeah. in the multiple expansion, yeah. there's one M, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, oh, yeah. Now, I, this is a point I should have emphasized more. If I understand it right, uh, in, the, in the multipole, that's a kind of limit where the rotor um, is effectively a very, very low Mach number. Okay, this is something I want to explore further. Um, yeah, I suspect, yeah, it may be that the rotor, the multipole, is a kind of outer limit when the rotor, for, when the Mach number is very low and the caustic radius. Is, is way greater than the rotor radius, yeah. So it may be that for the pure multipole, there's no such thing as the rotor radius. It's, it's disappeared as zero. Perhaps you don't understand that. No. I, I have to I'm write it. Simple yeah. Simple yeah, sorry, yeah, yes, yeah. okay. Okay, okay. sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I'll try and understand the question better after. Sorry, yeah. sorry. The same, what is the link between the magnum number so and the end which appear in the oh, they're, they're, they're different. Yeah, I'll tell you how that comes in. Yeah, I think I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Suppose I write down, I write down sine of n theta minus omega t. Okay. And I have, this is a spinning field. Okay. And we apply that um, to a rotor of radius r, the r, r, r zero. Okay. Now, if you look at the two parameters here, because it is theta minus omega t, this represents a, a rotation rate. But the n represents really like the number of blades. And but the sound you actually hear, the frequency you hear, is what's called the blade passing frequency. So what you hear is n omega. So then if then you have um, the rotation rate for omega here, so this is omega. Then the speed here of this outer bit is R zero rays omega. So the Mach number of the, of the tip is R omega over C. And then it'd be a different. So, so that, that is the, the, uh, the Mach number. I don't know if that answers your question, but getting near. I'm still getting to the, where we started with the J subscript M, yeah. which is the order. Yeah. So where does how does the choice of little n affect things? Oh, that, 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 uh, well, yeah, I've got it. It's J n, whatever, e to the i n t. Yeah, yeah, because in the separable solution, if you have e to the, this is just, the, yeah, just a separable yeah, solution. Yeah, I know that, but, you know that, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So that means then that if you decide in advance, you're going to have n lobes. Well, I decide I'm going to have n lobes. Then that forces the J at that forces okay. yeah, So the the but well, in principle you could have maybe I suppose you can't have any you can't have these different, you know, it wouldn't be a solution of the wave equation. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. So that's right. So they're linked. So basically, this and this is linked. Now the M factor that came in. This is for the cylindrical problem. Now for the I also had a, a M where I had P and N. This is a distinction between tetral harmonics and azimuthal harmonics because in the three D. See, if, you, if I give you, um, I'll, I'll, I'll call this angle now phi going around here, and the angle theta is up here. I'm sorry, uh, theta here from the axis. If I have, say, n, if I have um, m phi here, then this can hook on to a, a large number of p and m's, you see, p n m. And then I think sorry to so always have to think which one of this is. And you'll see the three. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So basically yeah. once you get so once you go to the once you go to the three G, you have an extra parameter. But there's always a link, you see, because the in the PNM, uh, well, I've got a different I'll just put five to be consistent, you call it five here. The n here is always the same as the n here. And then with the associated resolving function, you've got this extra parameter n. So in the spherical problem, then you've got an extra parameter. Well, let me get clear. Yes. N are in the vessel uh, function correspond to the number of blades. Uh, yeah, it, it does, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. You have to, yeah, because it does, yes. Okay. You have to think sometimes whether you've got a, a doubling. Because if you have n blades, if you had one, if you had say two blades, mm -hmm. then you've got say a plus, and each one has a force on it, it's going to be high, low, high, low, high. So it's going to be like cos two theta once you allow for the negative bit between the blades. So, yeah. I have another question. Yeah. In regard to the scattering problem. Yeah. Suppose you have a few scatterers. A few scatterers, yeah. Yeah. Is it easy from your formula to tell whether some are outside of the Radius and I think it's easy. I think that bit's easy. Right. It's just a purely yeah, geometric. Inverse, yeah, yeah, because basically with any formula, whenever you have anything that's Jn of Kr, you know at once the transition takes place when n equals Kr. So it's always easy to know at once where the transition takes place. But I mean the location of the scan. The it's yeah. inverse problem. Oh, oh, the inverse problem. Oh, I right. don't know. That sounds rather hard. I wouldn't like to say. No, suppose you know scattering. Ah, uh, can, can you can know? you do it in invert? Ah, uh, no. um, for multiple scattering, I can't immediately see how I would do that using rays. That might not be possible. I have to think about that. For but, one, you can. Right? No, for one, you can. But for, yeah. for two, I've never thought about that. But there might be something you can say. Yeah. yeah, there might be. If you're saying the near field, you might be able to do a Fourier decomposition. On some sphere or cylinder, yeah, I've never thought there might be a lot there. If you had imagine you had very high resolution for the directivity, right. it might be, okay. it might be, yeah. It's gonna come down. Okay, yeah, sorry, but if you do that, it'll come down some kind of average continuation. Uh, Probably because you're gonna have to somehow go inside I, the sphere. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was wondering the bias information. If there are precise bounds on. How accurate it is. On the Dubai approximation. Yeah, so I think the other day you, you were saying yeah. to me that if everyone said, oh, yeah, that's impossible for large items. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think there is. And in fact, your methods will, will give it because, uh, as we were discussing, the standard way to derive the Dubai approximation is exactly the kind of contour integral. And it's of historical interest. This, was, this might have been one of the earliest examples of uh, contour integrals being used. I'm not, I don't know whether the Summerfelt problem came first or the Dubai. This was very, very early on, and it's in Sommerfeld's book, for example. Um, yeah, so it's exactly uh, corresponding to two subtle points uh, coalescing. And again, there's a lot known about this. It's a particular very, very fine book by Krasov and Orla. Now, it's worth no uh, noting, especially it's emphasized in this book, there's a degree of indeterminacy about array, you see. And have you come across this Orla theory in Krasov? I draw my rays. As if they're exactly at known lines. But in fact, that's not quite right. There is a degree of indeterminacy of about a quarter of a wave. And I wait. 
So a, a, a ray really is not a completely public. That's another reason I don't like it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a completely determinant. <laughs> you're full of irrational conditions. You should have shaken off Fritz Ursa when you were born. <laughs> Too late now, probably. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, um, in fact, you can do that. You simply say that when the two saddle points are within a certain region, which you can estimate in terms of the parameters there, the wavelength. Yeah, so basically, it's when you get within a half a wavelength. That's kind of what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so again, so in fact, this is very, 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 very. So the point about your approach is that when you're far enough, you only need to be slightly far away for you not to need your ground bit, and then you get very, very accurate. But you do eventually need it when you're within your quarter, say half wavelength apart. You definitely do need your your circular your disk regions. You must have them. But what's surprising is this is what we're the question I asked you. If you're happy with two or three significant figures, which you are when you just do plots by eye, then we can say all you need is for your saddle points to be more than half a wavelength away, and this is fine. But if you want to get to say machine precision or six or seven digits, which is entirely worthy as a name, although I don't do it myself, absolutely worthy as a name, then you must do what you've done uh, uh, in full detail without scheming. So we've bombarded you with questions. So thank you very much. It's fascinating. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.